Well, my clock has just struck 11 a.m. here in Chicago, and it is a pleasure to welcome you formally to Saints and Sinners, featuring Richard Payne. My name is Seth Green, and on a morning like this one, I'm especially proud to say that I'm the Dean of the Graham School at the University of Chicago. And for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are part of the original plan of this university envisioned by William Rainey Harper to revolutionize university study in this country. He had a vision that the cutting edge ideas of this new university in 1890 would not just be for our traditional undergraduate or graduate students, but indeed would be extended through this extension, the first of its type in the country, that would allow people from all over to participate. And indeed, uh, we share the story that we were the origin of the distance learning movement in this country. In 1895, we started correspondence courses for credit so that people who needed to be on their farms for part of the year could actually get readings and instruction via mail and then mail back in their writing. And so we have been at the forefront of lifelong learning for 130 years. And today, who we are is defined by four different areas of programming. We have one of the most rigorous and respected masters of liberal arts in the world. We have a basic program of liberal education where you can go deep into the foundations of liberal education through the Socratic-based process of discussion. We have an open program that allows you to see across all of the disciplines of this university, and we're going to have a conversation with someone who is teaching in that program this winter, Richard Payne. Uh, and then we have an annual set of programs that allow you to do everything from look into the future of museum publishing to better know your Chicago. I'll just share that across all of what we do, there are four distinguishing features. Uh, we are part of this large and complex and wonderful ecosystem that we call the University of Chicago, where big ideas are born that challenge and change the world. And as many of you know, we are now officially into our 14th presidency here because we had wonderful festivities late last week to inaugurate President Paul Alvisados. We are also rooted in the liberal arts. And so one distinguishing factor is that we try to bring everything we do even when we're talking about very timely topics, back to how we look at this across time and space. And you can see there are some of the books that inspire us and that are core to the basic program. Uh, one very happy distinguishing factor, and Richard is an extraordinary example, is that incredible faculty and instructors elect to teach with us. And so it means that we are able to be part of the truly great minds that make this university so special. And then we believe the greatest distinguishing factor is all of you. We have people that are really serious about learning. Uh, there is a saying from Kendall Sharp, who many of you know, uh, who leads our basic program, that we put the adult in adult learning. And having now visited more than 20 classrooms over my deanship, I will just share that I'm blown away by the sincerity and seriousness with which all of you learn. Uh, we're a place that gives out across many different programs only one degree and one certificate. And that is because most people are coming for the true joy of discernment and knowledge in the university's motto of growing knowledge from more to more and so be human life enriched. Uh, and so with that, let me move us on to why you're here uh, after showing you this slide of what's coming up. You're here to talk with Richard Payne, who is an associate professor here at the University of Chicago in the Humanities Department. He is a historian of the Iranian world in late antiquity with a recent book, A State of Mixture, which explores the problem of religious diversity within the Iranian Empire. I will say that one of the many uh, aspects in which he is leading is on the global front. He's bringing so many different perspectives to his writing, and it includes currently collaborative projects in Berlin, Paris, Buenos Aires, and New Delhi, which if you look at that geographically, you will notice literally puts him all over the world. And I believe uh, he, he's out of the country today as a, an example of that. Uh, and we are talking with him, not just because we are really excited to learn from him, but also because he is someone who will be teaching this winter a class with the same title as today's conversation, Saints and Sinners, which will explore saints and sinners who influence Christianity 
in the Middle East, especially during that time of late antiquity. And we'll look at the dialectical relationship of these two groups through not only the Middle East, which we might be expected in the Roman Empire, but also through the Iranian, the kingdoms of the Caucasus, Central Asia, and Ethiopia. And so with that, let me stop sharing my screen so that you all can see the person that we're speaking with. And uh, Dr. Payne, let me get started by laying the table for our discussion by exploring the world before the rise of Christianity. So we're going to talk a lot about this rise, but I want to start by just laying the table what was happening before kind of Christianity came to the fore. And we had a prep conversation. And I have to say, even as someone who had the joy of working under uh, you know, one of your colleagues, Mark Cohen, when I was in school myself, I had not realized the extent to which religion changed in late antiquity. Uh, the Greeks and the ancient Egyptians and others had gods, but people, when we were talking about this, did not necessarily identify in the same way that they do today and since late antiquity as a formal member of a religious group. And so I'm curious if we can just start by having you share with our audience a bit about this idea of how the meaning of religion and its role in society looks before late antiquity and then how it begins to change in late antiquity. Thank you so much for the um, introduction there, Seth. Um, um, I, and thank you for the invitation. And thanks to all of you for taking the time to, to join us. Um, I can see why you're so proud of the Graham, Seth, and that you can rally upward of 100, uh, 100 <laughs> people in an audience for a lecture on ancient history. Um, mm -hmm. So I hope, I hope I do not disappoint. So very nice to see you all. Um, so, and, and thank you for the question, um, which I think gets really at the heart of one of my goals in this class, which is exploring just how radical a break um, Christianity represents, um, not only in traditional ways of organizing uh, religious communities uh, and indeed organizing societies, um, but also in, th in thinking about the self um, in relation to those societies. Um, one should not attribute um, all of these transformations to Christianity in and of itself. Um, Christianity is part of a um, broader movement, um, a term I use sort of loosely, um, that we can we can kind of talk about sort of the, the makers of religion. Um, and, and by religion there, I mean religion, um, not quite in the modern sense of religion, but in a more or less cognate sense. Um, that is to say, this idea that you have a single identity, um, you are a member of X group, um, you possess um, X doctrines, which define you as a member of that group, um, as well as um, X associated practices. Um, um, that through which you perform your membership um, in that group and, 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 and um, create structures of belonging. Um, and that is quite radically new in the second, third century CE um, with Christianity and with Manichaeism. Um, and, and in that early period, it's very interesting to look at Christianity and Manichaeism um, alongside one another as, as communities that co-develop um, in conversation with one another. Um, and that's something that uh, we certainly do in the class. Not a lot of people know about Manichaeism and the evidence is often from um, places like uh, Western China that are very much off of the map of most ancient historians, um, but um, are very interesting to put in conversation with early Christian um, texts and, 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 and modalities of communal organization. And what those Christian and Manichaean communities, um, what, what they introduced was this, what I call radical break, which is to say that we are a member of this group and we are fundamentally different um, from everyone else. Um, we are completely unlike um, all other um, uh, practitioners of anything we might uh, loosely call religious or uh, religions or ways of dealing with the metahuman, um, to put it in more sort of neutral terminology. Um, that is polytheists um, of, uh, of all kinds in the Mediterranean world or in the Middle East, um, you know, engaged in a variety of practices, um, certainly um, espoused particular doctrines um, and often very closely identified with those doctrines but did not have a single sort of term for themselves as a community, didn't represent themselves or think of themselves um, as having a single identity, um, to use a, a troubled word, but a word that I think does capture some of what's going on in this period, the creation of a religious identity um, and specific structures that mark out uh, those members of a community as fundamentally different from all other members of a community. Now, this is a way of, of thinking about um, religious identity that comes totally naturally to us, right? I mean, that's the world we still live in. Um, and this is one of the ways in which there are transformations that take place in late antiquity um, with which we still live, um, whether we like it or not. Um, and of course, there are places in the world where this idea that everyone has a single religious identity and that means you cannot have other doctrines or, um, or, or, or other beliefs or, or other practices, right? Um, it still doesn't sit that well in East Asia, um, especially Northeast Asia. 
Um, but most of the rest of the world, this kind of this way of thinking about the self and thinking about religious community has become normative. Um, and it becomes normative in this period. I mean, what I think is so interesting in, in looking at these second and third century texts is really seeing how radical a break uh, these ideas represent um, and trying to explain how they gain currency. Um, why is it um, that so many um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of persons uh, adopt these categories um, with which to represent themselves, um, categories that we might loosely call religious identities. Um, and again, it's not just a Christian phenomena, it's a Manichaean phenomena. Um, and interestingly, it also becomes a polytheist and Zoroastrian phenomenon. So we see polytheist communities, um, and this is very well studied in the Roman world, um, also begin to identify themselves in ways that look more or less like um, these categories of religious identity and community. Um, my favorite example is Zoroastrianism. So um, I work primarily, um, you know, I'm trained in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Most of my research is on Iran um, and Christian Zoroastrian interactions. Um, and in Zoroastrian, in the Zoroastrian case, right, the Zoroastrians have a very clear sense of having different doctrines from other groups, but they don't have a single identity for themselves. Um, and that, that, their, their, their community is not sort of marked out as fundamentally different. It's, it's actually quite integrative. Um, they're able to, to bring in a variety of practices from outside, institutions from outside. It's very readily adaptive. Um, and over the course of late antiquity, Zoroastrianism becomes increasingly sort of bounded um, and framed in these categories of exclusive religious community and exclusive religious identity um, to the extent that um, words appear in Middle Persian that we can kind of translate as religion. Um, a word Dane um, is actually, there's a Middle Persian word is arguably the first sort of historical appearance of a term that looks anything like um, the modern word religion. Um, you know, there's nothing in Latin or Greek or Old Ethiopic or Armenian that, let, that sounds like that, at least not initially. It first appears in Middle Persian in the third century. Um, and it's being used by Zoroastrians who are arguing with Manichaeans and probably also with Christians. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's in that encounter between exclusivist religious communities or with exclusivist religious communities, excuse me, that pre-Christian, pre-Manichaean ways of thinking about religion become transformed um, and start to look more like what we call religion. Well, this is fascinating because I think that so many of us are so used to understanding religion as it exists today, but it's even hard to realize how people might have looked at gods and other forms of spirituality prior to this moment in late antiquity. I want to now begin looking forward. So, you know, you've set the table, Christianity is rising, people are beginning now to identify with this at the hundreds of thousands and, you know, eventually millions. And one thing that I thought was really interesting is Many people look at this from a theological perspective, and they look at the you know, writings of the time and how the religion is evolving. You look at religion from the perspective of a social, economic, and political lens. So, so you're looking at the influence and how this religious life interacts with all of these other domains. And so I'm curious if you can talk about what the rise of Christianity in late antiquity means socially, economically, and politically. So um, massive question, uh, Seth, but that does get really, I think, at the heart of, of my approach, um, it, which comes out of a school, so to speak, of, of scholars working on um, Christianity in late antiquity, um, which is to try to put the pieces back together, so to speak. So we typically study religion in isolation from the economy, in isolation from um, political culture, right, um, or social history. Um, and, you know, I'd say from about, you know, the 80s onward, um, uh, scholars have begun sort of starting to put those pieces back together and say that, well, we can't actually separate. Um, you know, if we think about just this in our, in our own lives or in the lives of our acquaint acquaintances around us, right? We all know that, you know, religious ideas have a massive influence on the way that money circulates, um, even in a putatively secular society, right? Um, or we have other living examples like in the Islamic world where, you know, Islamic finance and so on. So we know religion and the economy can't really be separated. But traditionally, scholars are trained to do so. Um, and in fact, they're in different departments. So, um, you know, looking at, so just to take maybe um, it's such a, um, it's such a big question. Maybe I'll just talk a little bit about, you know, the economy, um, which is to say that a very important um, commitment of early Christians, part of their doctrinal repertoire, so to speak, um, is the reorganization of wealth, um, specifically what we broadly call charity, which is ab absolutely central importance in early Christian communities. Um, that is, those who have wealth are supposed to donate um, to the so-called poor, 
um, which increasingly becomes identified um, with the organizational apparatus of what we might call the church, um, because it was the one of the principal occupations of a bishop was to effectively redistribute resources for, um, in the first instance, widows and orphans, um, who count as foremost among the so-called poor, and in the second instance, for other groups who could be labeled poor. Um, and there's a massive debate in early Christian communities. And the answer to that question, who is poor, looks very different in sort of each region um, under each bishop um, and, and over time starts to acquire sort of regional characteristics, right? So the question of who constitutes the poor looks very different in say Ethiopia in the seventh century than it does in say um, Francia, you know, what's now in Northern France um, in the, in, at the same time period, right? Um, but though that category of the poor could include members of the clergy, it could include monks and ascetics, um, it could include um, it could include consecrated virgins um, who were organized independently, especially in, in the East. Um, it could include the truly destitute poor, right? The way most of us would probably, um, uh, that would probably be our foremost definition of the poor, right? Um, those who actually don't have the resources to feed themselves and clothe themselves. This was a major preoccupation of, this is what bishops did, right? We think of bishops, we think of sort of famous historical theologians like Augustine of Hippo, but Augustine famously complained um, about the everyday administrative bureaucratic burdens that he carried um, to which he was he thought of himself subject. Um, and that was you know, caring for the poor and um, equally importantly, the administration of justice, right? Episcopal courts um, become um, one of the most important um, settings for, um, uh, for the, the pursuit of justice, for the settlement of disputes, um, not just in Roman society, but in every society in which Christian institutions took root, um, including places like Northeast Africa and the Iranian world. So when we think about a bishop, we have to sort of, you know, uh, it's not to say that the theology of Augustine is not important, not at all. Um, but we also, it's also quite interesting to look at the development of these communities and institutions um, against the backdrop of um, economic changes, economic transformations. Um, and not just to see a close relationship between the rise of Christianity and the expansion of the Roman economy, um, which is sort of the opposite of what most historians thought 30 years ago, um, but also then to look at the recursive effects of Christian ideas and institutions on those economies themselves, right? So by the, by the seventh century in much of the Mediterranean world um, and, and much of the Middle East, uh, we're in a world in which monasteries and bishoprics um, are the single most important landowners, right? Um, in, in an agrarian economy, right? So in an economy in which landowning is the most important source of wealth, right? So, um, you know, it's imagining the, you know, Forbes 500 um, being, you know, um, at least half of it being uh, monks and bishops, um, you know, by the end of the seventh century. Of course, I'm completely um, concocting that, that completely ludicrous statistic, um, but it gives you at least a sense. Um, from the ground up, there are places like Northern Iraq um, or Armenia or Upper Egypt, um, or some parts of Francia, Northern France, what's now Northern France, Belgium, and Western Germany, where monasteries own an, the overwhelming majority of the land, right? Um, and the world, and they're collecting taxes, minting coinage in some cases. Um, they're, they're literally administering the political economy of a region in Francia on behalf of a Christian king, but in Upper Egypt on behalf of a Muslim governor um, who serves a Muslim caliph. Um, but the actual regional political economy is in the hands of bishops and monks, right? Um, that's a very different kind of world um, than what pertained, say, in the second and third century. So I think it's very important not just to look at how um, Christian institutions um, co-develop with the economy, that is how they materially develop um, in relation to the economic histories of their respective regions, but also to look at the effects of Christianity on the economy. Um, and, to, to, uh, and a concomitant of that, is a very significant uh, transfer of wealth away from the traditional aristocracies um, to the church. Um, uh, so, you know, th that is uh, part of the way in which the church becomes, churches and monasteries become so wealthy is through donations. Um, so we can see a real impact of Christian thinking on the everyday economic activities um, of the, you know, what we could call the Roman 1% or the post-Roman 1%. Um, so um, I think it's very important to look at the relationship between religion and the economy, not just to study religion more um, effectively, but also to study the economy more effectively. We can't understand the late Roman economy without those, um, those, those changes that arise from Christian thinking and institutional practice.
Well, so that gives us a very insightful picture of the economic relationship. I want to go a little bit deeper on the politics. And specifically, you're describing this ascendancy of Christianity and this, I mean, real um, consolidation in some ways of, of influence and, and power, uh, you know, assuming that that money and all of that um, ability to tax and, and play a role is a form of power. And, and I'm curious because, you know, this is a time when there are emperors and those emperors um, in, until a certain point have, you know, separate identities from the church. And so, you know, going back, let's say to, you know, some of the beginning of this rise, you know, you have, for example, Constantine in the, you know, 306 to 337 period of time. Uh, how do these emperors look at this rising force of Christianity and how did they interact with it? Because there's such an interesting story here about, you know, a traditional form of power and then this rising form. And it's just curious to think about how these two interact and how that also from a political standpoint, in addition to the economy, is shaping the identity and characteristics of each. Sure. Um, so, I mean, you know, the, the most obvious case, like I, I'm tempted to take a kind of case study from Armenia or Ethiopia, which where things look very different, but I can't help but sort of go back to the to the, the stock theme of Constantine, right, and, and kind of um, the relationship between Christianity and the Roman imperial office. And of course, I think all of you are probably familiar in broad outlines with the story of Constantine's conversion. And one of the interesting sort of impossibilities there is ever saying, you know, was Constantine sincere uh, <laughs> in his conversion to Christianity? Or, or did he actually convert to Christianity with the goal of co-opting ecclesiastical institutions in the service of Roman power, right? Well, for me, that's you know not really a problem because we can never really reconstruct human motives, right? Think about how difficult that is even to do with people we know very well, uh, let alone with people in the distant past without sources. And I also wonder cognitively whether it's ever possible actually to extricate immaterial ideals from material uh, necessities. But in any case, um, you know, Constantine, uh, by, by any measure, uh, certainly finds himself uh, empowered um, with, the, with the conversion to Christianity um, in the sense that very concretely, he now has a representative um, who is loyal to him, that is, who bypasses the normal provincial bureaucratic structures of the state um, and can speak directly to the central imperial court in Constantinople. Um, so now uh, that is um, every city has a bishop, right? One city, one bishop. So in every urban or even many semi-urban communities across the Roman world, there was a bishop um, who now at least has the potential to have a direct relationship with the emperor. Um, what that gave emperors um, was, you know, as I say, a chance to bypass traditional bureaucratic structures. Um, it gave them more direct power. Um, and so the story of the Christianization of the Roman imperial office is certainly part of the story of the intensification of the Roman state uh, or the power of the Roman state or the reach of the Roman state at the local level. Um, um, we could call it something like Roman centralization. It's a very fraught term. Um, it's kind of inaccurate, but it captures something of what's going on. That is the Roman state is trying to rule its provinces more directly with more um, uh, you know, homogenous institutions of government. And bishops certainly facilitate that process to a great degree. And over the ensuing few centuries, bishops are increasingly competing um, with local elites, with local aristocrats, um, with local agents of the Roman state for influence and for power. Um, and certainly by the end of the sixth century, in many places, bishops are the primary form of local government. Um, you know, that is, they are, there, there might be a kind of secular government in place in the Roman, in the Roman Empire, there always is, but the bishop is frequently outshining um, whatever provincial governor may be active. That's not always the case, but it's sometimes the case. So it sets up this kind of um, alternative sphere of authority available to the emperors. At the same time, it's not entirely available to the emperors and the bishops are never under imperial control completely. Right? <laughs> bishops at the same time are constantly contesting the authority of the emperors, um, constraining the authority of the emperors, right? Um, most famously, um, of course, the, the case of um, uh, the, the case of the, the, emperor, the emperor Theodosius um, being called to account uh, by the Bishop Ambrose um, for his uh, adjudication of the destruction of a synagogue. Um, uh, events like this um, you know, were, uh, were, were, were major moments in, for the Roman public. Everyone knew about what all elites knew about these moments. They were very, they, they circulated very widely because they had a kind of constitutional status, right? To what extent can a bishop actually critique an emperor? Uh, 
or refuse to cooperate with an emperor. Um, and, and, and bishops very often did refuse to cooperate with emperors um, and very frequently did appeal to emperors to change their policies. Um, they were not simply, uh, they were not easily married to the interests of the Roman state, rather they increasingly shaped the interests of the Roman state. Um, but again, it was never a complete um, alliance. Um, and especially the matter of doctrine creates um, enormous conflict um, in Roman society and Roman political culture, um, as of course, a great many bishops refused to sign on with the doctrinal formulae. I, again, going back to the problem of religion, right? If you're gonna say, we all have this identity because we believe this, well, defining what this is is going <laughs> to divide the community, right? Um, and this is the story of, this is the basic sort of, you know, if you pick up any kind of textbook on the history of Christianity, it's probably gonna be structured um, along the lines of doctrinal division, right? Um, uh, which is one way of writing the history of Christianity. I think there are other more interesting ways, but that, that's one way of organizing the history of Christianity. It's one way of organizing the history of Islam. Um, that is exclusivist monotheisms tend to fragment, right? Over doctrinal questions. And that's precisely, of course, what happens um, in the Roman world. Uh, so, um, you know, certainly the, and here again, the materiality of Christianity is very important, right? Uh, understanding that there is a, a bishop with very significant, uh, a very significant economic operation, um, even at the most simple level of bishops in the third century, they're bringing in enormous amounts of wealth in donations, and they're redistributing a very significant amount of wealth within their communities, right? So they play very big economic roles in their communities that affect even those who are not Christian. Um, and they, after Constantine um, gives the Episcopal court the sanction of Roman law, um, the, the courts of Christians are massively influential, sort of inescapably oh. influential. So even if you're not Christian, your social, economic, political life in the Roman world is being affected by Christian institutions. Um, so I think looking at sort of how much power bishops are able to accumulate at the local level in the pursuit of their idealistic interests, let me say, right? So when I say that bishops are acquiring power, I'm not kind of unmasking bishops as sort of these uh, power hungry uh, men. Of course, they were men. Um, although there are ways in which, of course, where their relationship to power needs to be um, interrogated. Um, but I do want to say that, um, uh, that, that, that their ideals were, um, in their own minds at least, uh, very real. But at the local level, bishops are accumulating so much power um, that the Roman state would need to define its relationship to these organizations in some way or another. Um, and that is why I think the story of Christianity and political power is equally interesting in societies that never become Christian or political cultures that never become Christian. So in Iran, which remains, the political elite remains Zoroastrian, the kings of kings um, and the Iranian aristocrats who never question their Zoroastrianism, they are very actively engaged in co-opting bishops um, and making sure that uh, the, the organizations of Christian communities work in concert with the interests of a non-Christian state. Um, we can see the broad outlines of that also with Christianity in China where the first thing Christian monks and bishops in China do is seek workable relations with the emperors um, and seek the patronage of the imperial court, um, uh, even though there's no question of the Chinese emperors ever converting. Right? Um, Christian organizations work very well with political power, even when the political power in question is um, not Christian in the slightest. Um, and of course, that, that really um, culminates with early Islam in which bishops and monks are the, the kind of first, the first member, the first, the first sort of elites in the Roman and Iranian worlds to sign up with the caliphs. You know, they sort of come running to the local courts of the caliphs and say, "Hey, you know, um, we're we're going to be reliable local agents um, in in the in the, the mountains of northern Iraq or the the, the plains of northern Iraq or Upper Egypt or etc." But I, I'm getting a little bit long winded here. But just there's so many different ways to approach that question, Seth. But I hope I've highlighted some of the ones that I think are. Um, exciting and ones that we'll, we would pursue um, in this class. Yeah, you brilliantly highlighted them and um, gotten me more excited about the course. I'm going to ask you one final question. We'll make this a power round just because I see some great questions in the chat and I want to make sure we get to them. Um, so maybe in like the 90 second version, and I know this is another big question, but I want to just make sure we get to the social aspect. And one of the roles that Christianity begins to carve out socially during this time period, although it has economic and political implications as well, is this role of speaking for the, the so-called poor and taking on the charge of being an agent of justice. And I'm curious if you can describe, you know, in short form, what that role looks like and the meaning that it has even on the church's role 
in this time period today? So, um, well, um, uh, one thing that I'll, I'll just highlight is sort of you know, how, whenever we have um, archives uh, or actual textual evidence of sort of what bishops do, we see them dealing with um, pretty significant sums of wealth um, and, and organizing that wealth with um, their particular um, Christian or Episcopal imperatives in mind. Um, that is the feeding of the so-called widows and, and, and orphans um, is certainly a matter of everyday work, right? Um, not just concern, but there's an administrative apparatus in place that tries to um, guarantee a kind of baseline um, of nourishment um, for destitute members of the community. Um, of course, um, as I already alluded, within that category of the poor, right, many widows, of course, were not um, destitute. Um, and certainly, um, you know, one could debate, right, the extent to which this sort of charity, in fact, benefited the neediest uh, of the Roman world, or um, I can here only speak of the Roman world because we don't have these archives for Iran um, or for Christian communities in Central Asia or South India or Ethiopia. Um, but certainly we do see them very actively engaged in um, the charitable redistribution of wealth, um, charitable by their definition. Um, and increasingly ascetics, um, that is monks um, and ascetic priests and bishops become a, the primary objects of that giving. Um, so, um, you know, certainly uh, members of the Christian religious professional class, so to speak, um, become ever more visible in those sources. Um, and and the, the destitute or the seemingly destitute um, or the, or the, the, the vulnerable, um, they don't they never entirely recede from view, uh, but they become a bit less prominent. Um, in terms of justice, you know, it, one thing that we really have to keep in mind is that, um, you know, when we talk about law and history, people sort of assume like modern police states, right, or some some legal apparatus that governs everything, right? But um, actually, um, you know, law is mostly about sort of solving practical problems that people have. Um, and in the Roman world, um, like in the 21st century American world, um, if you have a, a practical problem that the law could fix, well, your first problem is is financing the lawsuit, right? I mean, um, you know, most people have a practical problem that the law would help with can't do that, right? They can't. It's not easy to go hire a lawyer, right? Um, uh, so, of course, we have ways of dealing with that and so on. But um, in the Roman world, it was even more, um, there was access to jurisprudence was even more radically unequal. Um, and so when, when Episcopal courts gain this normativity under Roman law, um, there is literally a flood of petitioners um, to bishops to get the most basic problems resolved. Um, and, and uh, you know, what are most of the problems about? Of course, they're mostly inheritance disputes, right? What do people actually right. argue about violently in the ancient world or in the <laughs> modern world is usually inheritance. Um, and, and so bishops find really quickly that they need to become experts in Roman law. Um, and one thing we actually see is that by the end of the fourth century, um, having a Roman law degree, uh, right? I mean, it's a little anachronistic, but not entirely. Actually, legal training was pretty formalized in places like Beirut. Um, if you had studied law in Beirut, you know, that was sort of the best qualification you could imagine for being a bishop, um, not having sterling theological credentials. Um, and in fact, many bishops were forced into the role on account of the legal expertise uh, without any interest in religion whatsoever. Um, and, and of course, there are examples of, of individuals who had never converted to Christianity, um, who are kind of forced by their communities to become bishops in order to um, defend their interests. So the Episcopal court is just massively important. Um, right, this is where most people are going to get their problems solved if they had a chance to solve them. Um, and we can really discern the agency of um, the Roman underclass um, here. Mostly it's what we would call the kind of middling class, um, that is free landowners who had some wealth, but not much. Um, they're the big beneficiaries of things like the Episcopal court. Um, and I've written on this quite extensively in, in the Iranian case as well. This is something that Christian communities globally um, the Episcopal court is something that a bishop is supposed to have. Um, it's the bishop's job to settle conflicts within the community, which meant that bishops had to become experts in local law. Um, and in the Iranian case, that meant Zoroastrian law. There is no secular law in the Iranian world. So bishops had to become fully conversant and trained in a legal system that was unambiguously religious in nature. Um, that is almost every word in that legal system has some Zoroastrian cosmological meaning um, and purpose. 
So wherever we see bishops in action, we see them dealing with local forms of law and gaining expertise in order to deal with the very concrete problems that um, you know their um, uh, their communities uh, their communities have. Well, so I'm going to come now to the questions that are in the chat, and I'm going to start with one from Philip Kennedy. And he asks, please speak to the effect of the collapse of the Roman Empire structure and the emergence of the church as a structure to fit the political, social, financial vacuum. And so if you can just think about how do those two you know, events in many ways coincide, the, the fall in some ways of the Roman Empire and the rise of, of Christianity. Yeah, um, excellent, excellent question. And a very nice continuation from the comments that um, I was just making um, in that one of the things that we see, of course, as, you, as, your, as your question suggests, um, is that uh, bishops in particular sort of fill the space um, that the empire leaves. Um, so bishops, um, let's take the example of, of law, since I was just talking uh, uh, about, about Roman law. Um, so if, if, the, if the Roman bureaucracy sort of dissolves, well, the Roman bureaucracy was actually really local elites who served functions, right? So often those local families are still there. Uh, if we take the example of, say, northern France, you know, the region around, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Tours, because that's a place where we have a, the great history of Gregory of Tours, which we'll read in the class. Um, so this, this place Tours, the Loire Valley, right? The local elites are all sort of post-Roman. I mean, they think of themselves as Roman um, even long after the Roman Empire has existed, but what they've lost are the formal paths of education in, for example, Roman law or in how Roman taxation works. So the institution um, in Northern France that maintains that knowledge is the bishopric. The bishoprics know exactly how Roman law works. They preserve um, abbreviated collections of Roman legal texts, some of which survive. Um, and they also, they also interestingly maintain knowledge of how the Roman fiscal system worked. So when the, the, the Frankish Merovingian rulers sort of want advice on how more effectively to tax their populations, advice they did not often pursue, but when they did, um, bishops had that knowledge, right? Uh, how do you collect taxes? Well, the bishops knew how to do that. Um, it's bishops who we see in some instances reintroduce coinage. Um, of course, coinage being right one of the most um, effective institutions for um, streamlining um, the collection of taxes, right, um, and the organization of state fiscality. Bishops are often involved in that process. So um, it, it's it's it, it's it's a question of uh, bishops in particular preserving many of the institutions of the Roman state long after the Roman states disappeared. Um, we could take that at an ideological level as well. Right? Bishops are also preserving texts of Roman history. They're preserving um, memories of the empire um, and so on. Um, let me also just you know, um, compare to what happens in the East um, where the exact same phenomenon is discernible. Um, that is after the early Islamic conquest of much of the Middle East, um, bishops are frequently the ones who introduce um, their new Muslim governors to the pre-existing local tax system. Um, and they act as intermediaries of that tax system um, on behalf of those early Muslim rulers. Um, and, and they position themselves in this very lucrative position. If you wanna get rich in the ancient world, you get a cut of the tax system, right? No one gets rich through hard work in the ancient world. You get rich through cutting yourself into the tax system, right? Um, if you're controlling that transaction, then you, you can manipulate the currency exchange between base metal coinage and, and, and precious metal coinage. So you can manipulate the currencies every day of the week and it's, you're basically guaranteed a very stable revenue. So um, uh, bishops and monks position themselves in this, in, this, in, this, in this position, not I think entirely in order to um, gain wealth, right? But also to protect and petition their, for their communities, right? Um, and to maintain certain privileges that their communities had acquired. Um, we also see, for example, in the first, in the first few decades after the Islamic conquests, bishops begin to introduce new Christian laws. Uh, for example, the first Christian marriage, um, legally um, constructed Christian marriage institution um, is created um, in a region called Beit Qatraye, which is basically modern Qatar, Bahrain in the Persian Gulf region. Um, that's where we have the first Christian legal marriage contract produced by a bishop for his community. And it's an example of Christians innovating new legal institutions when the pre-existing state, in this case, Iran, has disappeared. Uh, and that gave the bishops um, space to create new institutions. Um, and and, 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 and uh, if you look at the papyri from Egypt or um, Armenian texts from this period as well, it really looks like a Christian theocracy from below. 
um, the early Islamic world, interestingly, looks like a Christian theocracy from below, because the bishops actually have an almost complete monopoly on, um, on, on law um, and on the fiscal system, um, on behalf, of course, of their Muslim rulers. But um, at the local level, right, um, they have accumulated all of this power, and they introduce all sorts of new law. We actually have a kind of Christian theor theor uh, theocratic theory um, written in Armenian. It's the first Christian theocratic theory that I know of. Um, it's written in Armenia in the late seventh, early eighth centuries. In exactly this context of Christians experimenting with how to create state structures of their own when an empire has just disappeared and adapting the know-how of the pre-existing empire, how to create a state um, with the opportunities that they were granted in the early Islamic context, which was a really high degree of lo local autonomy. Um, so again, I got a little bit long-winded there, <laughs> um, but thank you for the question. Uh, well, and so we're going to go to, <laughs> oh, a very satisfying and, uh, I mean, a deeply interesting answer. Um, and I apologize for saying this because your answers are so brilliant and incisive. Um, but we're going to aim to get two more questions in, um, in power round form, just to make sure we get through as many of the chat questions as possible. Um, so we have one here, which is no easy one to answer quickly, uh, but Christianity and monarchism are said to break with antiquity and create a religious identity. Does Judaism bridge this transition? And so, yes. you know, just the kind of question of where Judaism fits in this in short form. Yes, this is a very um, big and fascinating question. So, um, uh, it, it, and a short answer is very, is very hard of this one. So I would say that um, this is work that needs to be done actually. There has been no scholar of, um, Jewish forms of self-representation or communal self-understanding um, from say the second temple period through the rabbinic era that has taken on board these questions of what is religious identity in this period, how does it change? Um, certainly, um, you know, the, the, the origins of this Christian and Manichaean way of thinking about the self and representing religious community have their origins in Judaism. Um, precisely what those origins look like, how we should talk about them, I think is very much an open question. Um, what I'm saying about Manichaeism is very recent research, it's only the past few years um, with the, the republication of this um, Manichaean codex um, that sort of re-enlivened this debate. Um, there's fascinating work on Jewish identity in the second temple period. One of the big problems that we have is of course the evidence uh, for Jewish communities between the second um, and fifth centuries, right? So we have the Yerushalmi, we have the Bavli, um, but we don't have a lot of textual evidence for how um, Jewish communities understood and represented themselves um, in, this, in, in this period. The one really interesting thing um, is what my um, former teacher of Princeton, Philip Schaefer, um, uh, called the, the kind of co-development of the church and the synagogue, right? Um, that it's not an accident that architecturally um, synagogues and churches look so alike um, and often appear alongside one another, almost alongside one another in the same places, right? There's a ways in which these communities come to resemble one another um, in this period. The big X factor question is how the Manichaean story fits, uh, because that synagogue and, and ecclesiastical development story comes a little bit later, the archaeology sort of fourth century. Um, so um, I'm here on my, my questions, my, I'm sorry, my answer is definitely disappointing, um, but your question sort of, for me, one of the most exciting in the field. Um, and and um, and one um, that you know I would love to organize a workshop on or a discussion on um, at Chicago at some point in the not too distant future. So final question for you: There's someone who wants to know more about the course you'll be teaching. If you are able to highlight a text or two that you'll be reading, and what you hope a student in it takes away. Absolutely. So um, the way that I plan on structuring the course is very similar to the way I structure my, my seminars um, for advanced undergraduates or grad students. Um, we focus on one text each class, um, a fun text. Um, that is, I like texts that are intellectually fun. In this period, we have a lot of fun texts. Um, to the extent that ancient historians have fun texts, I think we have them in this period, um, especially with the history of, of early Christianity or, or Judaism or, or, or Manichaeism or Islam. Um, so uh, for example, the life of Simeon Stylites, um, who is a saint who lives literally on top of a pillar, um, uh, you know, about a uh, 30, 40 foot high pillar. I forgot the exact uh, measurement. Um, and, you know, um, tries to create a life of isolation for himself in the villages of Syria, fails to do so and decides that he'd rather live in the air. 
So he, he has a, a pillar erected for himself. He lives on this pillar um, and becomes the kind of mediary for intermediary for all sorts of local conflicts, right? The, all the mundane problems that I've said bishops are dealing with, um, monks and ascetics also would sometimes deal with. Um, and so we have a text that describes how this ascetic who lives on a pillar um, starves himself, all the predictable ascetic things, right? Um, um, uh, is is a, he's an example of Syri a sort of early Syrian asceticism where extreme forms of self-mortification um, are the norm. Um, so um, you know, lets his body go uh, in a pretty extreme way. Um, but I think a, a very fascinating text in terms of asceticism in this period and the relationship between asceticism and society um, in the sense that although this is an ascetic who's totally separate from the world, separates himself from the world um, as a saint, he is very much in the world of sinners um, on an everyday level. Um, that's one um, example. Um, uh, one other text that um, I mentioned to, uh, to Seth, I think, I think I've finished the course, the text I've not yet taught before, but it's so fascinating. Um, I'd love to include it in the class. Um, and it comes actually from later, it's beyond this period. So it's more about the legacy of this period for um, Christianity um, in, the, um, in subsequent periods or in the future. Um, and it's about um, uh, female ascetics um, in a monastery in Ethiopia. Um, where there are in, in the 15th century, um, where there are lots of stories of, of, of gender bending and experimentation, um, lots of stories of dealing with religious others. Um, you can imagine, right, ascetics living in the, the highlands of Ethiopia encounter lots of um, weird animals that they try to make sense of um, in their using, using earlier Christian texts, for example. Um, a really fascinating example of how Christianity, um, how, how the resources of, 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 of the Christian religion um, can be applied to radically different um, social, cultural, and even environmental contexts. Um, so I'll kind of stop there, but I'll also say uh, we're going to read the earliest Manichaean, the, the story of Mani, um, and who who's, um, you know, claims to travel the world and master almost all of its languages um, and combine the knowledge of Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Christianity and Judaism in a new synthesis, which I think is really revealing of the intellectual potential of this period that we often look at um, as having already have a preordained conclusion, um, a world of fixed religious boundaries that we've inherited. Um, and I think to make sense of our own world and what we want to do with it, or what we want to do within its confines, um, I do think we need to make sense of the origins of these religious communities, um, why they appeal to people, um, why um, they were why they were persuasive um, to to so many um, to so many um, humans in this age um, across Western Asia, right? Not just um, in the Roman world, um, Western Asia and North Africa. So yes. Well, yeah. Richard, thank you. Okay. This has been a I mean fascinating, engaging, a brilliant conversation. And at the opening, I said you know the university is a place where big ideas are born that change and challenge the world. And we often think of that in the future sense of, you know, how are better understanding climate change and tech and society, and we are there. One of the things I most admire though, is how we're also reimagining our understanding of the past and looking at it with new lenses. And I mean, ultimately bringing a new understanding to our world today, because as I hear you, you know, it makes me look at our current world differently. And that's what I think is so powerful about the history that you write is that you not only help us to better understand the past, but you also help to really give us a new lens uh, for the world that we live in today. So thank you. Um, I'm excited uh, personally for your course and grateful that you've chosen Graham School to teach it at. And uh, to all of you, thank you for joining us for another afternoon and for digging in to better understanding the world with us. Have a good afternoon since we're almost there here in Chicago uh, to everyone. Great. Thank you again for your for your attention, everyone. Um, and I hope to see some of you in the class um, or on campus uh, or um, somewhere else at some stage. Thanks again. Um, Bye. Oh, oh, go ahead, uh, Richard, if you want to finish off. I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, I was just going to say, yeah, thanks to you, Seth, for the invitation. And I'm excited to teach at Graham for the first time. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye.